So here we are. But anyway, the, during the week, the Lord put this thought on my heart. Uh, the last couple of Sundays, uh, since the new year, we've been preaching about faith. Uh, the first Sunday was uh, basic faith. Last week was faith, the faith of Abraham. And today I want to talk about uh, the topic, the faith of our fathers. And um, if you could take your Bible and, and turn with me real quickly, just for a second, to Hebrews chapter 12. <clears throat> We're actually going to be looking at chapters 11 and 12 today. Uh, we have a, <clears throat> a tall order to go through the whole chapter of chapter 11, but we'll get there in a little bit. <clears throat> but cha chapter 12 starts by saying, therefore, since we have such a great cloud of witnesses, you know, that have gone before us, let us now um, lay down the weight, you know, get over the weight and get over the sin and let us run this race with endurance. And so there's, there's, a, there's something to be said about the faith of our fathers and how we follow their example. And, and the, the key here is also that now, for many of us, we're following somebody, you know, but somebody's following us as well. So it's like a, it's, it's a self-perpetuating situation where we're following the faith of our fathers, but in many, in many ways, we've become the fathers and the mothers of the faith. How many here uh, are former Catholic or Catholic people or former Catholic people? I was brought up in the Catholic Church. I have, I have very, very good memories, actually, of being brought up in the Catholic Church, except the time when Sister Trebius gave me, a, uh, I mean, Sister Joseph gave me a right hook across the face when I was laughing at something inappropriately. But besides that, I have good, good remembrances of my time in Catholic school and Catholic Church. How many of you remember some of the songs that, that we would sing back in those days? Like, I remember one song was is Ave Maria. I don't know how biblically sound it is, but I, I love the song. Uh, one song I, I really liked was um, Holy, 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 which I don't know that, if that's a Catholic hymn or just a, just a hymn that Catholics and Protestants sing. But there's one song that really stuck with me, and as I was preparing for today, I, I remembered it. It's called Faith of Our Fathers. So we have a rendition of it, uh, sung by a young lady named... Uh, Alessandra Ceres, and I want, to, I want to share it, not to pretend that we're back in Catholic Church, but try to listen to the words of the song, because they really do minister to our hearts, that we have some, some fathers of the faith to kind of emulate and walk after and kind of live our life based upon their experience. So can we play that? Just maybe three minutes long. Oh. 
faith of our fathers, holy faith. We will be true to thee till death. And it makes me think along these lines, do we know the faith of our fathers? Do we have any spiritual fathers? Is there someone in our lives today that has been there, is doing that, and is walking a victorious life in Christ through many, many years of you know, serving the Lord? I, as I think about our church, I, I think about who's here, and um, I realize there are many people here that have been walking with the Lord for 10 years, 20 years, 30, some 40, 50 years. And, and to those that are, I commend you and we commend you, you're fighting the good fight. This is important. But you have now become examples that others will follow after you. Uh, now, some of us may not have thought that way, but if you've been serving the Lord for a couple of years, guess what? Someone's watching you. And you've, you've become, in a sense, uh, a spiritual father or mother to those around you. Uh, 1 Timothy 6, Paul puts it this way to Timothy. He says, to pursue righteousness and godliness and faith and uh, patience and love. But he says, to fight the good fight and to lay hold of eternal life. So we're commanded in the scriptures to fight this good fight, to do it. You know, every generation does it. Paul said in 2 Timothy 4, he said, I fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I've kept the faith. <clears throat> and there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness when I get to the other side. So we're encouraged to fight this fight. You know, go for it. Fight the fight of faith. But Paul says something really interesting in, uh, in 1 Corinthians 11 when he says, uh, so boldly and so confidently and uh, with a challenge. He says, uh, imitate me as I imitate Christ. And I think this is such, an, uh, such a bold statement to make, but he's realizing who he is and that other people are watching him and following him. And he's confident enough to say, you know, follow me as I follow Christ. And uh, this raises questions for me because Paul's also the one that said, it's no longer I that live, but Christ that lives in me. So follow me. He also is the one who said, I've counted all things as gain that I have for gain, all my credentials that I have. And he lists them in Philippians 3. <clears throat> but all these things I have, I lay them all down for loss that I may know God, that I may know him and know the power of his resurrection and, fell and know the fellowship of his sufferings. He's saying, so I ask myself, you know, I, many times, who am I, you know, imitating or following after? Who do I kind of, uh, who do I kind of hold in, in high esteem that I could follow after? You know, there's, there's basically a composite in my mind. So welcome into my mind this morning. I have a, com we all have composites in our mind. I'm not the only one. I know that. But I think about different people in my life that I know, that I knew, that I don't know, but I read about or read what they wrote or studied under them or whatever. And, and I think about all these people are somewhere in my mind, in my spirit. I kind of I follow their pattern that I, that, I, that, I, that I have observed over the years. So for instance, I, I, I really kind of follow and uh, emulate or kind of try to follow the example of my wife, Pamela. Pamela is one of the most disciplined people I know as far as studying the word and praying. Man, she's like a rock. She, she just is on track all the time. And she's also very good at finding humor in things, which really helps me out. I could be heavy at times. And she'll say, you know, lighten up. But I try to, I try to remember that and kind of live my life with that, you know? I think about my daughter, Stacy, and uh, she doesn't know I'm going to say this, but I know her really well. She's my child, you know, but I, she has great faith and she's been through some obstacles in life, but I've never seen her waver in her faith. I, I, I draw from that. I draw from that, Stacy. I do. I think about one of my former pastors, uh, Pastor Ray Tate, who was my pastor when I was in, uh, <clears throat> living in New York, going to church in Greenwich, where I sat under him as an assistant pastor. But, but this brother, man, he, he taught me the joy of the Lord. You know, I, I talk to him now. Every single time I speak to this brother, he makes me laugh. Even now, after all these years. I think I first met him in like the 80s. He's still making me laugh. But I learned from him, just, you know, it's going to be okay. Just find something to be happy about. <laughs> I think about 
our, our former superintendent of the assemblies, Bob Wise, <clears throat> who, um, who retired last year. But man, he leaves behind the legacy of sincerity that'll just kind of unsettle you. Like when he says, how, how are you doing? He, he really wants to know, how are you, do, how are you really doing, you know? And, uh, and I, re I learned from that. Like, you know, it's important to be sincere with people. I think about some other people that I've never met, but I've learned from. Uh, I go back in, in my, my time to uh, some of the early people that I read when I first came to the Lord. But David Wilkerson, never met the man. But man, his teachings and preachings on holiness and, and, and just being, being consecrated to God, they reverberate in my spirit. He, he's with the Lord now. But his teachings still reverberate in my spirit. I think about Jim Cimbala, who I mentioned from time to time. I met him a few times, pastor of Brooklyn Tabernacle. This guy, this man has such a, a great insight into the word. He's a great communicator. But you know what? He is so dedicated to prayer. He's leaving a legacy. His church, Brooklyn Tabernacle, has prayer meetings every Tuesday night that host about probably 800 to 1,000 people every Tuesday night. No preaching. They may worship and pray, but every Tuesday night, they've been doing this for probably 30 years or so. So he leaves behind a legacy of, of just dedication and prayer. I think about many different Assembly of God pastors and teachers and evangelists and missionaries, worship leaders that have constantly reminded me over the years that God is able. The Holy Spirit is still relevant today, even though we may hear from other, other streams of Christianity, the Holy Spirit doesn't work like he did in the book of Acts. And I'm constantly reminded by my comrades in the faith, oh yes, he does. Oh yes, he does. Acts chapter, uh, Acts, the whole book of Acts is relevant for today. I think about you know, people who have spoken into my life over the years that souls need to be saved. You need to keep going. You need to keep ministering. So there's souls out there that need Jesus. And those that are saved, they need to be discipled. So, so all, there's a whole composite of people in my mind and in my spirit that are telling me to keep going and, and how to keep going. So I want to encourage you today as we get into this message to think about some people in your lives that you may draw strength from. You may learn something from. You may kind of, you know, uh, emulate your life after them in some ways. Now, before you go any farther, I'm not saying to idolize anybody. Can I get an amen? Don't idolize anybody. Don't put anybody on a pedestal that they shouldn't be on. Don't bring anybody higher than what's, what's expected. But on the other hand, don't be afraid to learn something from somebody. Paul says, look, imitate me. It's like imitate Christ. He put himself out there. So there are people that we should emulate, that we should learn from and should grow from. Okay, all of that brings us to Hebrews chapter 11. Now, I realize Hebrews chapter 11, fairly long chapter, we're going to read the whole thing. <clears throat> and I also realize that this chapter all by itself is basically a sermon without any commentary. Just reading it is like a sermon. And then the sermon concludes in Hebrews chapter 12, the first couple of verses. But Hebrews 11 is, is known as the faith chapter. Most verses begin with two words, by faith, by faith, by faith. And so this chapter is here to encourage us, to help us, to help us build our faith, and to help us get going and to keep going uh, in the calling that God has called us into. And then it concludes with chapters, chapter 12, 1 and 2, where the first line is, therefore, since we have such a great cloud of witnesses. Let us put aside the weight and the sin. Let us run with endurance the race. And ultimately, in verse number two, if you look at 12, two, ultimately looking unto Jesus. Because all roads must lead to Jesus. All leaders must point to Jesus. All teachers must point to Jesus. All examples that we follow must bring us to Jesus. If not, it's the wrong leader. It's the wrong thing. It's, it has to go to Jesus. And so I want to go through chapter 11. <clears throat> I'll make a few comments as we go. But may the Lord use this to minister to your heart and to really encourage you today. So chapter 11, verse 1, the definition of faith. Now I'm using the New King James Version. So if you don't have this version, it may sound a little bit different. Not too much, but you may want to keep that in mind. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Can I, can I just make a few comments? 
Faith is knowing that you know that you know that you know. Faith is believing in God's promises when you don't see the promises. Faith is being aware of God's provision when there is no provision. Faith is, is grasping spiritually what we don't see physically. Like, for instance, salvation. How do you know that you're saved? There's something, I mean, well, I got saved one day. The next day I woke up and I looked in the mirror and it was the same guy that was not saved the day before. It was still me. But I knew that I knew that I was different. Because something happened in here. You know, we're saved by faith. But, but faith is, is like believing and trusting and perceiving things spiritually that we don't see in the natural. The verse 2. By it, the elders obtained a good testimony. Anyone want to have a good testimony? Get a hold of faith. Let faith shape your life. Let, let your legacy be a legacy of faith and trust in God. For by faith, in verse 3, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. God spoke the world into existence, right? So that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible, but God, God framed the world. By faith, we believe that. How do we, how do we know Genesis 1 and 2 is real? By faith. By faith. And so faith convicts us. That, and then what happens is, this is what happened to me. Tell me if this didn't happen to you. When I first got saved, I had faith. I believed in Jesus. But basically, I was all over the place. I needed the word of God to kind of harness me in and get me focused on, on where I should be going. So faith in the word is the way to go. Our faith in the word of God really sets us on the right course, the right direction. That's why we absolutely, desperately need the word of God. That's why we need not to be redundant, but we need Bible studies. We need preaching and teaching. You know, we need to get in the Word of God. We can't live without the Word of God. So many people have become shipwrecked. They have faith, but their faith is way out in left field before they even know it because they're not bounded by the Word. They think their Word is bigger than the Word, and that's when people get into trouble. So, verse number four, by faith... Uh, when Pastor Bill mentioned this this morning, I said, okay, Lord, I, I think I've got a little confirmation here. By faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. It wasn't because Abel sacrificed animals. Well, some people say that, but, but I don't think God would judge that like that. And Cain had sacrificed uh, produce. It wasn't like that. It was more like, like we said. It's an issue of the heart. Uh, through which he obtained a, a witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and through it, he being dead, he still speaks. So the sacrifice of Abel was better because it was pure. It was right. It wasn't, it wasn't holding back. I believe he gave the first fruit of his offering with a good heart. He wasn't holding anything back. He wasn't trying to manipulate. He was just giving it out of the goodness of his heart because he wanted to please God. And, and he's honored for that. Verse number five, by faith, Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death. Another word for taken away is raptured. You know, he was, he was taken out. He was removed. He was raptured, a foretaste of the rapture. But um, uh, he was taken away so that he might not see death. He was, and not, he was not found because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. I think about, uh, think about uh, Enoch uh, that was raptured, Genesis 5, 24. It says he walked with God. He trusted God. And God took him out. Because right after that whole thing came the whole episode of the flood and all the damage that was done. God removed him from all the trouble. Another little precursor of the rapture of the church before the calamities of, uh, of uh, tribulation. Then we go on. Verse uh, number six. By faith, it's impossible to please God. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. You know, so that, that, we could get into something. Some people say, I knew a guy. He used to say, you don't have to keep praying about that. Just believe it and it's done. When I read scriptures like this, I read scriptures like going before the judge, like constantly going before the judge. There's something about that. It's a heart matter. God's looking at our heart. How bad do we want it? How, how are we going to fight for what we want? And, you know, I'm not saying, you know, you have to do calisthenics with this, but I could, all I can tell you is 
I've got a testimony to share about one of my children that was not walking with God. And it was, it was, it was so difficult for us. We were here. We just moved here. And I determined I was going to fight for her soul. Nobody knew. I mean, I tried not to. Tell. Finally, I told the church and everybody prayed. But I used to come here early in the morning, like every day. And I used to walk around this church, upstairs, downstairs, walk around for an hour, you're banging on heaven's door. God, you got to do that. I was just, I was diligently seeking God. Did I see the results right away? No. <laughs> no, it was discouraging. But I knew what the word said. And I still fought it. I still did it. I still did it. I did it. And finally, after a while, after a long while, the, the, the hardness of the heart started to break. And I started to realize those prayers that God heard years before are now coming into play. But there's something about their faith. Faith is not always easy. Going back to verse number one, faith is knowing what you don't see. You know, I, I have to trust God. He's going to touch my daughter's heart. I don't see any action, but you know, years later, I did see action. So, yeah, at the time, it's not easy. But, you know, faith, faith gives us the motivation to keep going, even when we don't see anything. Now we go to verse number seven. So by faith, by faith Noah, being divinely warned of, of things not yet seen, moves with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness, which is according. Can you imagine that? There was no rain yet in the world. There were, it hadn't rained. And the Lord says, it's going to rain. Well, what's rain? It's going to, water's going to come down. There was mist before, but there was no rain. And it's on a mountain. So build a boat on a mountain. Does this make any sense? I'm going to wipe everything out, you know? But Noah, I'm going to save you and your family because you're a righteous man. And guess what? Noah had faith that what he was hearing was from God, was God. And he built the ark. Everyone mocked him and ridiculed him and rebuked him and made fun of him. But he built the ark. And when the rains came and everyone was dying off, getting drowned in the flood, the boat lifted and he was preserved. He was saved. But by faith, he did that. Verse number eight, by faith here, now from verses eight to verse 19, is all about Abraham and Sarah. Powerful words. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called out to the place which he would receive an inheritance, and he went out not knowing where he was going. Oh, my goodness. Just go. Okay, where? I'll tell you where. Just start going. Like Peter walking on the water. Just step out. Just, God will lead you, but you have faith that he'll show you where to go and how to do it. By faith, he dwelt in the land of promise as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with his son Isaac, his grandson Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he waited, look at this, he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. He waited for the new Jerusalem. He waited for his heavenly home. So the application is for us, as we go through this life and we, we do things in obedience to the Lord, we're serving the Lord. But our home is not here. We're waiting for the new Jerusalem. We're waiting for the heavenly home to come. We're just passing through. Look at what it says. Uh, he, uh, by faith, okay, Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed, and she bore a child when she was past the age because she judged him faithful who had promised that she would have a child. So here you have Abraham and Sarah, by faith, they're doing these historical uh, acts. Uh, verse, uh, verse 12, therefore from one man, and him as good as dead, because he was old, but through him were born as many as the stars of the sky in multitude, innumerable as the sand which is by the seashore. And all these died in faith. Not having received the promises, but having seen them from afar off, they were assured of them. They embraced them. They confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland. So we live by faith and we're doing things by faith because we're seeking a, a permanent homeland on the other side. We're just passing through. Verse 15, truly, if they had called to mind that country from which they had come out, they would have had the opportunity to return. In other words, by choice, they, they chose to follow after God. And they did. And Abraham had, a, had, had descendants, became the nation of Israel, and so forth. But verse 16, now 
They desire, that is, a, a heavenly country. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. We talked about this last week. Who he had received the promises offered up by his only begotten son, of whom it was said, in Isaac your seed shall be called. Can you imagine? He had Isaac, the promised child come, came, and through him... The seed would be passed down. Ultimately, the Messiah would come. But now the Lord is saying, sacrifice your son. It doesn't make sense, but, but verse 19 really sums it up. He concluded that God was able, let me paraphrase, even if I killed Isaac, even if I obeyed and killed him, God was able to raise him up from the dead, which it says, which he also received him in a figurative sense. So figuratively, he killed his son. Figuratively, his son was placed on the altar and he died so that he might live and continue with the promise. It's all by faith. This was basically last week's uh, sermon. We continue, verse 20. By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come, Genesis 27. By faith, Jacob, when he was dying, he blessed each of the sons of Joseph and worshiped, leaning on the staff of his, on the top of his staff. He also blessed all of his sons, but in particular, he blessed Joseph's sons uh, as he was worshiping God. The testimony, he was faithful to the end. His life wasn't always easy, but he was faithful to the end, blessing his kids. By faith, uh, Joseph, when he was dying, made mention of the departure of the children of Israel and gave instructions concerning his bones. By faith. He passed it on. Verse 23, 23 to 29 is all about Moses. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden three months by his parents because they saw that he was a beautiful child and they were not afraid of the king's command. So you could say Moses' parents were godly people. They had faith. Remember, they put him in the basket and put the basket in the river. By faith, Moses, when he became of age, he refused to be called one of the Pharaoh's uh, the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing, again, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. It's always a choice. By faith, he chose the more difficult road. Esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he looked to the reward. He looked beyond the present to the reward in heaven. By faith, he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Going back to verse number one, knowing what you don't see, or seeing what you can't see, but seeing it spiritually. By faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he who destroyed the firstborn should touch them. That's an interesting verse too, verse 28. By faith he kept those ordinances of God out of fear that if he didn't obey God, something would happen to him, right? By faith, he did it when it seemed ridiculous. He did it. 29, by faith, they passed through the Red Sea as by dry ground, whereas the Egyptians attempting to do so were drowned. So Moses leaves a tremendous legacy, you know, leaving behind the riches and the, 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 uh, all the education, everything that he had in Egypt, all the pleasures of life, for, for a difficult life of being in the desert and leading his people out, but he leaves a legacy of faith. Verse 30, by faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they were encircled for seven days. This is a story of Joshua, Moses', uh, Moses uh, uh, the one who replaced Moses. And here, here, Joshua has been given a command, go take Jericho. But before you take Jericho, march around the city seven times, seven days, and on the seventh day, march around the seven times and blow the trumpets. Okay. And he does it, and the walls come down, and they capture the city. By faith, by faith, he obeyed God. By faith, verse 31, the harlot Rahab. Whoa, whoa. What's she doing in here? That, that must be a misprint, right? Matthew, in fact, includes Rahab in the genealogy of Jesus. Wow, there's a harlot in the, wow, in the line? But by faith, you know, she did not perish with those who did not believe 
when she had received the spies. Remember Joshua and Caleb came to spy out the land? She hid them. And it says in James that, that faith must be accompanied by works. Her faith was there, but she, didn't, she never said anything, but she demonstrated it by hiding them. And her, her works were rewarded with her faith. And now she's in the genealogy. Verse 32. What more shall I say? In other words, there's so many more. Time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah and David and Samuel and all the prophets. I read uh, concerning prophets. There's probably about 40 in the Old Testament, maybe more, and about 25 or so in the New Testament. There are a lot of prophets who through faith, through faith, subdued kingdoms and worked righteousness, obtained promises and stopped the mouths of lions like the faith of Daniel. Quenched the, the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, became valiant in battle and turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Women, whoa, received their dead, raised to life again. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance. Listen to that, they were tortured choosing to be tortured rather than accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection. Go ahead, kill me. Do whatever you want. I don't care. I'm going to heaven. God will take care of me. So still others, verse 36, still others had a trial of mockings and scourgings and chains and imprisonment. Some were stoned, sawn in two. Some were tempted some were like, can you imagine if I just renounced my Lord, I could go home. They were tempted to say, forget it. But they stayed put. They, they stayed focused. They, they, you know, but um, they were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute and afflicted and tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains and dens and caves of the earth. Faith of our fathers faith of our Father. If you take those, these Old Testament people, you put them together with the New Testament and the early church, all those 120 from Acts 1 and 2, most of them were martyred for their faith. That's the faith of our fathers. You know, the blood of the martyrs. Where our faith is built on the blood of the martyrs. And isn't it ironic that today we have a whole movement saying that we're not supposed to suffer or anything. You know, but when you read the Bible, it's all you see. Any, any person of faith goes through stuff. I never read in the Bible that God delivers, a, the, the, keeps stuff from happening. I see God walking us through the problems of life. I never see, I never see as being problem free. I see as being, going through life with Jesus walking ahead of us, leading the way for us. And uh, so I don't know. But anyway, when I, when I read this kind of thing, I think, wow, this is, the, this is the faith we've chosen. We've chosen this faith. But this is our background. This is where our faith comes from. And like I said, New Testament, all those people had the same thing happen. Beheaded, crucified upside down, whatever. They were killed for their faith, thrown to the lions. That's our faith, faith of our fathers. So then it's verse 39, very interesting. These, having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise. What promise? The promise of the Messiah. They did all this without even seeing that the Messiah had come. Could you imagine? You know, we look back on it. We get it now. But they didn't know. I mean, they, they knew, but they never saw it. But they had all these promises. They died for the promise that Messiah is coming. They believed it that strongly. And they died, and, and, then, and then it says, which, which, by the way, gives me the confidence that we believe in the second coming. You know, we're looking for the second. They were looking for the first coming. We're looking back at the first coming. But we're looking for the second coming. And we've got to have faith that it's going to happen just the way that it's presented in the Word of God. And it's going to happen. But by faith, this is not even our home. We're looking for a new heaven, a new Jerusalem, right? We're registered in heaven. We're in the world, not of the world. Our home is over there where we're waiting for the second coming of Jesus to come. Yeah, amen. That's right. So, so then, so Peter says in 1 Peter uh, chapter 1, he says all these, in verse 39, all these Old Testament saints, the prophets, they're all looking for the promise, but they were hoping to see it. They never saw it. They never saw the age of grace. 
But Peter says they were, they were striving for it, trying to find it, trying to locate it. They never did find it. They lived by faith. We have it now. Praise God. And then verse 40, back in chapter 11, God having provided something better for us. Oh, I'm happy I didn't live in those days. Aren't you? I am really happy I didn't live in those days. But we, God has something better for us because we have the Messiah. We know he came, he lived, he did what he came to do. We have salvation through faith, you know, through the blood of Jesus. But at the end of verse 40, that, that they also should, should not be made perfect apart from us. So now you have a, a blending of the Old Testament saints and the New Testament saints are united by the blood of Jesus Christ. We're all one and the same. You know, they're waiting for the promise. We have something better. But through the blood of Christ and the resurrection of Christ, we are all one and the same family of God. Old and New Testament. That's the faith of our fathers. Amen. So, so now, now when this was written, there was no pause for the next chapter, 12. It was one big, mon, uh, one big manuscript. Therefore, he says, therefore, you, uh, we also, since we, have, uh, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, so since we have all this in the background of our mind, we have our history, we have all these examples of great men and women of God that did great things for the kingdom, through their lives and through their sacrifice, we have the faith now. The faith was delivered to us. But because of what they did, we have this great cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight. What does that mean? Well, it can't be sin because sin is in the next one. So this, the weight is the burden of life, the problems of life, the, the uncertainties of life, the the, 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 the hassles we go through, the, the things that weigh us down, the, the worry over paying bills or taking care of family or going to work or being healthy, whatever, lay aside the weight. Get over that. It's all right. It's going to be okay. Lay aside that. And, and also lay aside the sin also that so easily entangles you. Oh, yeah, that too. Like uh, pride or lust or... Whatever, you know, uh, whatever our thing is. But get over the sin. You'll put it under the blood. So you have life to deal with and you have sin to deal with. But then he says, run this race with endurance. Run this race. Look at the people behind you. Look at the people around you. Go keep your eyes toward the heaven and keep running this race, race with endurance. You know, don't, don't, don't falter. And you're not alone. That's what he's saying. You're not alone in all this. Look at the people who came before you. You think you have it bad? Look what they went through. That's what he's saying. But ultimately, he goes to verse number two. Because all leaders, all examples, all teachers ultimately lead to Jesus. Looking unto Jesus. Look at the great cloud, all right. But ultimately, look at Jesus. He's the one. He's the great one, you know. He's the one. He's the example to really follow after. And so he says, uh, look unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. He's the, he's the author and the finisher. Look at, look at Abraham. Look at Moses. Look at David. Draw strength. It's all good. It's all good. It's all wonderful. But look at Jesus because he started the whole thing in the first place. He's the author. He's the rock. He's the cornerstone. He's the source. He, he's, the, he's the foundation of our faith. Everything starts with Jesus. Everything. Everything finishes with Jesus. He's the finisher of our faith. Everything was created by him, through him, and for him, it says. And everything finishes with the Lord. He's the first and the last. He's the Alpha and the Omega. He always was and he always will be. So everything ends with Jesus. I can't wait to go to heaven. I want to see Jesus. Reminds me of a song somebody sang. They, I forget the name of it, but he's talking about he went to heaven and he saw John and he saw Peter and he saw this one and James. And, and they said, but I didn't see Jesus. And by the end of the song, he, he finally says, but then I saw Jesus. Woo, I want to see Jesus. Because this life, <laughs> this life is difficult. But I want to see Jesus. But look at Jesus, verse number two. This, uh, 
for the joy set before him, despising the cross, right? Is that what it says? For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, set down at the right hand. of. So you think Jesus had an easy time of it. He looked beyond the cross. He looked beyond the pain and the suffering for the joy that was set before What joy could he possibly be thinking of? Oh, soon I'm going to be with my father. Soon I'm going to be back where I came from in heaven. Soon this life will be over. I'll be with those that have faith in me for all of eternity. Soon I'm going to be there. For the joy set before him, he despised the shame, right? He, he, he endured the cross and, and the pain of the cross, the whipping, the beating, the blood. And, but he despised the shame. We don't think about the shame too much. He was humiliated. Think about it. This is the king of the Jews, sprawled out, naked, cut, bleeding on the ground, pierced, spit on, and belittled, and mocked, and ridiculed, and he, he, was, he was put to shame, despising the shame, he endured the cross, and then he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God in victory, in triumph, at rest, at peace, finally. So verse number three is where it all comes together. Consider him. You have the great cloud of witnesses. Great. Learn from them. But consider this Jesus. It says in verse three, um, who endured the cross, despised the shame, and so forth, lest you become weary and discouraged. You know, so here, here's the, it all comes together. Look at the examples. Look at people in our lives. We learn from everybody. It's all good. Ultimately, we look at Jesus, who did not have an easy road of it, an easy time of it. Look at him, lest you become uh, discouraged and weary. Verse number four, it kind of summarizes, for you have not resisted to bloodshed, striving against sin. In other words, you, ha you think you have it so bad, but you're not anywhere close to what Jesus went through. You're not anywhere close what the forefathers went through. You're not anywhere close where the New Testament martyrs, what they went through, or even martyrs of today that are going through it right now as we speak. People are going through it. So the faith of our fathers, wow, it's a lot to it. So I want to summarize this by, by saying it this way. The faith of our fathers must always lead us to Jesus. Has to, right? But, but a couple of the four things I talked about, we need to have people in our lives, believers, brothers and sisters in Christ, personal friends that we could draw strength from, we could be encouraged by. That's why attending church, having fellowship is so important. We draw strength from one another. That's how it's supposed to be designed. Then we, 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 uh, we, uh, we have believers that teach us things, teachers, leaders, that are pouring into our lives. We kind of learn from them and copy them in a way. Then we have the many different characters in the Word of God. How many of you are familiar with so many characters in the Bible? You read about their lives and you say, man, they did that? And God still used them? Wow. Or they did that in faith? Wow. I, we draw from that. We learn from that. We, we're encouraged by that. And ultimately, we look unto Jesus who went through that whole thing of the cross. Think of the movie, The Passion. If you need a visual depiction in your mind, that's what it was like, probably similar. But he went through all of that to get on the other side in victory. So look at what he did and draw strength from what he did. And then 1 Corinthians 11, 1, this is the thing. Imitate me as I imitate Christ. Well, here's the word. Imitate somebody but someone's imitating you. So how are you handling that? I mean, I think we have to do both. We have to, you know, imitate, emulate someone, follow someone. Yeah, like I have all this composite in my mind. But I realize people are following me now. They're not following the people in my mind. They're following what they see in the flesh. And so here we are. We have like those before us and those after us. And where are you in all of that? You need both. You need to follow those that went before you, but you have to realize you're leading someone that's coming behind you. I mentioned before there's people in the church that have been here 10 years, 20, 30, whatever. Some have been here for one year, 
And they may, look at, they may be saved for one year, not even. And they're looking at you who've been maybe saved for five years like you're an old pro at this already. Whether you realize it or not, you're perceived that way. You're part of the church. You know, you're part of what's going on. So you must know something. Well, you know more than they know. So you have become a leader for them, so to speak. So in closing, I just want to encourage you to, to draw strength from the fathers of our faith. And also realize that you are a father or mother of the faith as well. We need both at the same time. Amen. Let's stand together.